Welcome back to the Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Sudikang. Today is the first of a three-part series where we go back to a few clips from the early interviews on project management. We'll hear from David Stewart on the toughest hurdle transitioning into that very first project manager role. Richard Adet discusses the ups and downs of budgeting and scheduling within a project. Adriana Girdler recommends how to overcome pain points with difficult stakeholders. And Jim Lewis tells this fascinating story about his biggest mistake in project management. We'll also hear from David Barrett, Andy Kaufman, Kieran Bondell, and Nigel Smith on topics ranging from communication, leadership, psychological safety, and agile coaching. So sit back, enjoy the show, and we'll see you at the end of the video. What's the toughest hurdle of transition into the first project management role with TELUS, and how did you overcome, how did you overcome it? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, it was uh, dealing with time. Time management was the most difficult thing because uh, as, as I got more and more involved in things at TELUS, um, I had my hands in a, a lot of different pies. Um, one was, first one was building sites or augmenting existing sites where it already had cellular communications, but we had to change out antennas and put up new ones and run more feed lines and add equipment and add more power. In some cases, they have to reinforce the tower. If you need more antennas, I can't support it. Engineering's, engineers do a, um, a tower analysis of the uh, wind loading and weight and uh, everything is taken into account um, so there's a, a lot of processes that have to fall into place in order for it all to come together um, one of the first things being real estate um, they have to get real estate agreements sometimes on rooftops to add more antennas usually the, the landlord wants more money um, so all that has to be in place first before you can start work and um, yeah, dealing with uh, dealing with landlords um, you get crews in that do might damage something in the entrance way or um, you got to fix it all and make it right i had to had a company that spilled a bucket of paint down the side of a high-rise building onto um, patio furniture and everything else green paint <laughs> they got it all off and uh, replaced the patio furniture. But uh, yeah, lots, lots of stories there. Just out of curiosity, do you ever go over budget? Do you ever go over time? I think you do. And I, I don't necessarily, uh, there's different perspectives on this, but it's, it's, not necessarily a, it's not necessarily a bad thing um, because often what, what happens, right, is you... Um, and we can maybe get into this later with agile delivery, but ultimately things come up that you haven't accounted for um, and changing the path you're taking isn't necessarily a bad thing. If it's um, like, if it, if it ultimately meets the customer's needs better. So in, in a more waterfall model, what would typically happen is uh, when a change comes up that you haven't anticipated, you've, file a sheet of paperwork, you file a change request, and you, you just change the time and scope of the budget. Uh, what I guess is less desirable and what does happen, right, is unanticipated, <laughs> unanticipated challenges. Uh, and then it gets more complicated, uh, but uh, ultimately, right, you, at the end of a project, right, you try to adopt lessons learned and uh, try to get better over time. We hope that we learn from the lessons learned. It doesn't always happen, but we hope. <laughs> I have a, I, I do have someone on my team who once who once always said these are almost more like lessons observed, <laughs> uh, and there are there are challenges right in uh, in larger organizations that sometimes uh, uh, we we do we do our best. So have you have you had any difficult stakeholders, and if so, what's your advice to our audience on how to overcome those pain points? Okay, of course I had difficult stakeholders. <laughs> if I said no, I would be lying. <laughs> so just to be clear for your audience, a stakeholder is anyone who touches the project. So I think people forget that. 
it's uh, so the stakeholder could be someone who's actually going to be the end user of the deliverable that you are project managing, and they may just come into contact a little bit. It could be your project team members and their stakeholders, your sponsor, your steering committee, executive individuals, anybody who really touches a project as a stakeholder. And one of the things that I'm a big believer in is change management, really good change management. And so part of change management in conjunction with project management which by the way, can be two projects on their own. Like I've been on a project where we had project technical project management, and then we had change management project management. <laughs> and they, like there were two project managers doing those two side-by-side -side things. Um, so, you know, is, is good stakeholder analysis is really important. Understanding where people's thoughts are, what their needs are, how do they need to be communicated to, how do they have to be brought along uh, the cycle of the project, because not all st stakeholders need to be brought along the same way. So yeah, every single category that I mentioned to you, I've had difficulty with. And why? It's because it's people. People. People have their own baggage that they bring to the table, which has nothing to do with what you're working on, but they may be that, you know, they're constantly, you know, on a point where like, okay, can we just get past this, but they can't. And it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with the project. It's your own emotional baggage. So that's why it's really important to understand the people part of things and, and really emotional intelligence, um, you know, team dynamics, anything, even psychology. Like I use a lot of, I don't use psychology because you can't use psychology. I understand psychology so that when I have those difficult stakeholders, I kind of try to see where they're coming from and adjust my positioning to bring them into the fold because ultimately the win is when we're all working together. That's the win, right? I don't want to isolate anyone. So I will spend time with, you know, people accordingly, but there also comes a point where you got to stop, right? It comes to, I have to stop and I need to move forward with the project. I've done my due diligence and um, I have the advantage of having clients. So I say, look, I've done everything. This is now on your shoe. Your, your, it's on your plate. You got to deal with it. What's been your biggest mistake in the field of project management and what did you learn from it? I think the biggest mistake I made uh, was when I worked at, at ITT and we had to design a new uh, receiver, uh, HF single sideband receiver, uh, to replace a previous generation unit. And the challenge was that we had to cost reduce at 30%. In other words, we had to build it for 30% less than the previous model. And instead of tuning in 100 hertz increments, it had to tune in 10 hertz increments. So we had to make it perform better. We also had to increase the intermodulation distortion uh, capabilities so it was more selective. It could reject interference better. In other words, we had to make it perform like a Cadillac for the price of a Chevrolet. And uh, great challenge. I love that sort of thing. That's where the innovation comes in. Uh, we designed a, a totally modular unit so that you could change a module and have that thing running again in about 10 minutes. The reason for that is a, an oil tanker sitting in port cannot sail without that radio. It's life-saving. And it cost $100,000 a day back in 1970 for them to sit in port waiting for you to fix the radio. And so for us to be able to exchange a module, take the module back to the shop and repair it at, at our convenience, save them a huge amount of money. Now, the mistake I made was I had a brand new crew of people. None of us knew beans about designing a synthesizer. Like I say, the guy that was a digital guy uh, had worked on courses toward a PhD, but he hadn't finished his program yet. And uh, we had no experience by which to make estimates. You know, when you're trying to uh, estimate how long cutting edge technology is going to take, you might as well throw papers down a stairwell and see where they land. You know, it's about that accurate. And so, and, and the, the biggest mistake I made in the project was planning in more detail than I could manage. Uh, that's a rule that I, I've taught to this day. Don't ever plan in more detail than you can manage. I was planning to the nearest day and the best we could manage was at least to the nearest week. And of course, once you put together a plan to the nearest day, the powers that be are looking at it and monitoring it. And as soon as you're off target, they want to know why. 
And it was really funny. One of my guys was a fellow from India and, and I'd hired him away from a major uh, company that was our competitor. And the director went in the lab one day and started leaning on this guy about why was he not getting his work done as fast as he thought it should be done. And when he left, this guy looked at me, he says, Jim, putting two jockeys on one horse will not make him run faster. <laughs> which I thought was off, awfully on target, you know, because putting a lot of pressure on a knowledge worker is not going to make him do his work better or faster. So that was the big mistake. I learned an awful lot from that. And in fact, it was the last project I ran. I, I was finished by the time I got through with that one, but that radio worked. And, and I found a review a few years ago on the internet, of a, of a ham radio operator who had managed to get one of them and he was raving about it and it made my ego feel really good that you know in the long <laughs> run we were vindicated even though, even though we missed all our targets uh, that's amazing. well we did we did meet the cost target we just didn't meet the schedule target so your presentations and speaking events often focus on communication leadership strategy for project managers so why is communication so important for project managers and what can we as PMs do to be more effective communicators on projects? Hmm. Well, I think that PM uh, are support communication. Um, I, I think I think that first of all, I think the PM uh, the communication side is so important because project management is all about flowing information from one place to another, and that's communicating. Whether it comes from here, or whether it's a visual on the air, or it's a report, or it's an email, or a discussion, or me learning and listening. It's all about moving information from A to B or A to F or A to G. And um, we don't spend enough time teaching this skill. We teach the science of communicating in that PIMBAC focus first few years as project managers, um, but we don't give it enough time. We teach the science in that you should have a communications plan. You should have a stakeholder analysis. That's all cool stuff, but we don't do a very good job on the art of communicating, I believe. And and I will also say, Marcus, that in my in my travels, we take the lessons about the communication stakeholder analysis and all that. But we just don't use it. We don't do it. And we don't spend enough time at the front end of our projects to think about who's on our team and what we're all about, how we're going to communicate and how we are going to relate to each other and how we're going to make decisions. I call that a, uh, the team charter. And a team charter is not something I made up. It's real. You can go to my blog at davidbarrett.ca, and I have written about it numerous times. Every project to start with a project charter, of course, but a team charter. Let's go in and just talk about us as a team. Forget budget, forget risk, forget all the other junk. Um, and we just don't do it well. We don't give it at the front end enough time and enough focus to put the most important tool in place, the communications piece. Yeah, so um, it's critical, we get it wrong. PMI, others have said it's it's the res, it's it's the cause of massive amounts of failure in our world and project management because we don't communicate well uh, to to PMI to to uh, listeners to project managers anywhere. I say get it right. Be a good communicator, not a great. Just be a good communicator. Pay attention. Find your gaps. Are you a good presenter? Are you a great presenter? No. Fix it. Go to go to uh, Toastmasters, take lessons, go to courses. Are you a good writer? Are you, do you know your grammar? Do you know how to construct a sentence? Do you know how to be concise? No, go take a lesson, take a course. Do you know how to read the audience? Do you know how to understand who's who in the zoo and who's going to get this information? That's one of our biggest problems, Marcus. Hmm. We don't, you know, we look at the audience, we go, oh, here, and we open the fire hose. Rather than say, this group needs something that's very different from that group, that's very different from that group. Thus, why am I speaking the same thing to all of you or being very careful about how I say it? So um, all this says, find your gaps, take some lessons, take a course, join a community, read, follow, whatever it takes to be a better communicator, because that's where we are all falling down. Yeah. So what are two ways you think that a project manager can excel at leading people? Yeah, that's a really good question, Marcus. And the um, the older I get, the uh, the less satisfied I am with simple answers to more complex questions. So I, I really believe there's a lot increasingly. In fact, I just posted on it this week a lot to do with the context of the culture 
the context of the industry and the team and all the other stuff. So there's not a one size fits all in so many of these things, but um, here's one thing that comes to mind is one way to get better at leading teams is to make sure we're not getting in the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're not over managing. And I just recently had a podcast with a, uh, uh, she wrote a book called managing up. And the interesting thing is it's good for learning to manage up, but you can't read the book without learning to how to be a better manager too. <laughs> Cause you're like that difficult manager that someone's trying to manage up. That might be me. <laughs> and so, um, she talked about the difference between micromanaging and being nitpicky. And that was really helpful for me because I don't, I honestly don't think I micromanage my team, but I am nitpicky and I'm nitpicky. And so the, the point I'm trying to make here is if someone wants to get better at leading, you have to make sure we're not getting in the way. And, and too often what happens is like my, my story, I got promoted and, and as I got more promoted, but this was where I started under stress, I'd go to my blankie. <laughs> I'd be like, like, you know, assign me a bug. I still got my mojo. And they're like, no, I, I, I could easily get in the way myself. And so learning how to get out of the way is one thing. And then learning how to best serve our team. So certainly there's a lot of uh, good emphasis on servant leadership or serving leadership these days. But uh, Marcus Buckingham told me during, when I was interviewing him, he said, there's two questions that you should ask your team members each week. And he goes, there's research to back this up. Your team will perform uh, more effectively if you ask these two questions, right? So this is from Marcus's book, uh, Nine Lies About Work. Nine Lies About Work. About work. Uh, the first question is, what are your priorities this week? Now notice, I'm not going up to my team and saying, hey, these are my priorities this week, right? It is, hey, hey Marcus, what are your priorities this week? And, and you're not just gratuitously asking the question. You really want to know. So, so, so then why, why is that powerful? Because I'm connecting. I'm asking for the context from you. You feel listened to. You know? And so there's just uh, great power in that. A lot of people feel effectively invisible. In fact, Marcus told me that um, you, can build the, you can build the worst manager ever, and that is to ignore your team. So, so each week to say, Hey, Marcus, Hey, what, what's your, uh, what are your top priorities this week? Second question, what do you need from me? So in both cases, it's just two practical questions for servant leadership. Now that's not all servant leadership, but it's really what that comes down to. So how do you get better? Get out of the way, make sure that we're not the, the, you know, the, the line of most resistance. We're slowing things down because everything has to go through us, whether it's micromanaging or nitpickiness. And the other is, Asking those two questions, the simple questions, very easy to do. Yeah, that's, yeah. You can be large and large and in charge without looking like you're large and in charge. Right. You have to, yeah, ask the right questions and and yeah. fo put the focus on other people, not yourself. Yeah, Mark, Marcus. I, one of the things I love about Mark, you know, he's the father of the strengths movement, but he, he that nine lies about workbook um, really tries to expose a lot of a lot of the problems that we have with feedback systems and all kinds of stuff and culture. He's got some really good commentary on culture, but there, there really is something about asking the questions and he goes, there's research behind those questions. So try that. You say, don't blame corporate culture on psychological safety. What do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, for sure. So the article I had written was, was something that I had run into many times when speaking to people about psychological safety. Uh, I would give a presentation on the topic and invariably one or two people in the audience would ask, well, I want to promote psychological safety within my team, but there's forces outside of my team, uh, organizational challenges, uh, management dysfunctions, a toxic culture that prevents me from building psychological safety within my team. I agree with that to a certain extent. We do want our senior leadership to take a stand and to kind of bake psychological safety into the core values of the organization. We also want them, them to be modeling the behavior that we're expecting everyone in the organization is following as far as safety is concerned. But if we just sit back and wait for that to happen, it might take years and it may never happen at all. I think it's really important that all of us views ourselves as leaders. We are in an opportunity to be able to at least build a safe working space in the confines of our team. And what that might mean is that you as the leader might need to act as the buffer or the shield. 
to your team members. Keep them safe so that they can stay focused on their work. They can experiment, take chances, uh, be authentic, be vulnerable, but you're gonna act as that safety net that might separate them from the, the functional managers or other stakeholders outside of the team who may be operating in an unsafe manner or might be reducing or eroding safety within the team. So I think it, it's, it's absolutely a cop out for anyone to say, I'd like to distill psychological safety, but I can't do it because of stuff that's outside of my sphere of control or sphere of influence. In that case, you're not being a leader. In the confines and the context of that organization, yes. I think being a leader, being a project manager, and creating those buffers is so important. And uh, that, that's how you get things done, right? That's how you get things done. So seven deadly project manager sins you talk about in your book. Let's talk about a few of those. Can you discuss Yeah, that? a couple of the ones that I would touch on. One is uh, neglecting stakeholders. Uh, it's very easy, especially for people that are new to project management, to focus on uh, the ones that are the loudest, the stakeholders that are the loudest. It's that old expression about the squeaky wheel gets greased. Uh, in terms of project management, it means we're going to give those stakeholders a lot more face time. We're going to engage with them a lot more. We're going to try to keep them happy. But what I've found over my career is that rarely is it the stakeholder that's jumping up and down in your face that's the one you really need to be worried about. Because most of the time, everyone's aware of their problems already, and the team's probably already doing what they need to do to keep that stakeholder happy, or at least kind of calm them down. It's the ones that are quiet, that maybe are unwilling to directly come to you and say, hey, we've got a problem. Those are the ones I watch out for. The silent stakeholders are the ones that when you're not looking, they're going to reach around behind you and stab you in the back, or they're going to go and talk to your manager or to your sponsor and say, I think we need to remove this project manager from this project. Those are the ones that you need to keep an eye on. So when you've done your stakeholder analysis, if you've determined that a particular stakeholder is a key stakeholder, they have significant potential influence or impact over your project. And for one reason or another, they're being really quiet. That should be sending an alarm bell off. You should be kind of putting a reminder in your calendar on a semi-regular basis. I need to reach out and kind of have a conversation with that individual or that stakeholder group just to understand, take a pulse reading, see how they're doing. Is there something that we can, we are doing that is turning them off or annoying them? How could we keep, how can we treat them in a more fair manner? So that's one of the lessons I would share. So you've been involved with agile coaching, something you, or that's near and dear to your heart. How as a coach, do you help organizations identify their vision and coach them toward a future state where those benefits are realized? Okay. Well, first and foremost, I have to say, when I start, when we started this a few moments ago, I talked about being an accidental project manager. I started life in the automotive industry, Mark, because it is very much command and control style project manager management, very old fashioned, uh, seemed to work, but wasn't always that effective. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, with the onset of the dot-com boom and, you know, the, the rise in fame of Google, Facebook, Amazon, all these people started to embrace, particularly in the software industry, the more agile techniques. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me that you've got two important aspects of project delivery. One is the task itself, but one is also the softer, more relational part, you know, the soft skills, if you will. And I learned the hard way that command and control doesn't work. And so I was looking for something to fill that void to help me with my interpersonal skills and to relate to people uh, much better. So I went off and became certified as a coach, performance coach, and that really gave me that raft of soft skills and competence that I needed. And again, things like active listening, things like communication goes back into that triad with Toastmasters about how effective that can be really joined it all together. So project management, coaching, and Toastmasters for communication, I think in, in, in my parlor at least, equals the new agile project manager in that sense. Because the agile project manager is not about, as I say, command and control. It's more about the servant leader right. style. And, and I often refer to my role as being the road sweeper, you know, that clears mm. the freeway you know, of all obstacles, distractions, cones, accidents, wherever it may be. And then the project team is following through and they've got a clear sight. You know, there's nothing going to get in the way. There's no nothing that's going to uh, take them off course. 
So from that perspective, just getting back to your question, of course, from a coaching angle, working with clients, you know, it really does go back to uh, Stephen Covey and his, you know, seven habits of highly effective people. Habit number two, rather, you know, begin with the end in mind. What is it that uh, is the goal in mind? What, what is that future state that needs to be realized? Because if you're not specific about where you want to get, you know, it's a little bit like the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland, really. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. So really be specific about what that future state is. Then work with them to identify with them providing the suggestions about what that path can be and then bringing it down from the big vision into small, manageable, you know, tangible steps, uh, which is going to move them closer and closer to the destined outcomes that they want. But it does start with the client. It does start with their vision. And really, fundamentally, it starts with um, what they can do about the situation. If these videos provided you value, stay tuned for part two with a few more excerpts from past interviews on project management. Until then, have an amazing day and see you soon. And now a word from our sponsors. The Lewis Institute provides an enterprise project management program that does more than just train PMs. It helps support them from the CEO level on down. These courses help certify project leaders and prepare them to pass the PMP exam.